Um, so I'm not going to start with the data center because any business doesn't start with the, you never look at it from the infrastructure to the, to mm -hmm. the customer. You look at it from the customer um, to the yeah. infrastructure. So if you look at, so to say, the, the yellow parts of my model, they're usually marked mm -hmm. yellow down here, not the blue parts. The blue parts are databases of mm -hmm. just variables. Um, and I used AWS here as the baseline. But what I'm in this sheet specifically, I'm modeling, I'm modeling the demand. And what I did, uh, as you can see here, I took the, I could consider like the average instance type, which is like M5D on mm -hmm. AWS. And I looked, took basically their pricing table for um, on-demand, reserved, and three-year pricing. Spot is too difficult to do in a, in a static spreadsheet, so I didn't mm -hmm. do that. And there here, you already see one really critical thing. So you, you, you see up here 12 cents, or, or actually mm -hmm. one cent. <laughs> um, and that's how AWS actually prices these instances, because this number here is just that number up there, so, so this 1.2 cent, or one, mm -hmm. one, I can't even say how, one, one, 1. 1.2 cents, I think. Um, yeah. It's just memory, the amount of memory multiplied by that. So ultimately what they're pricing oh. in every class is memory. And memory has different prices depending on what kind of CPUs in the instance, but ultimately every other variable in the, um, nothing correlates as, as memory to price. So you can divide any of their prices by memory. You get to this to to like the the amount per gigabyte, and then you can really mm. remultiply it by whatever memory is in there. And if you now check the price list of AWS, it will match perfectly. So that's okay. their pricing formula. Um, so that's interesting, I think at least. Um, what I also didn't do in this model now, I, I didn't configure any cost of sales, but you will see how much profit mm. there is, and then you can do that uh, yourself. Um, so now the next question is now you have a price list and then the question is how much of that product are you selling in a given month? Um, mm. And this is what always looks a lot very complicated, but it, it's really not. Um, it's it's literally, I'm just saying in this month, um, I'm selling, I use a percentage here to make my life a bit easier, but I basically say a, a, a month has 720 computing hours potentially that I could sell. And I basically want to define how many hours of which instance in which price class have I sold to uh, customers. And I use the percentages to just kind of make that a bit easier for me to define mm -hmm. and, and model. But you basically, I sell 3,600 hours of M5D large mm -hmm. in the on-demand pricing. And that yields what I call an inventory. So then down here, you see... How many hours have I sold in any given month? Sorry, this is, by, mm. by the way, months here up here, month by month. It's a two-year uh, frame. Um, and you, of course, you can make it longer and more, 10-year frame, but it's just to exemplify the, make the point. So here you basically see how many compute hours have I sold per instance type. That's my mm. inventory. That's how much demand I have aggregated or, or, or generated. And that converts into revenues. Right. Mm. So here is just raw. This is not profit. It's just raw revenue based on price list multiplied by hours. Um, mm. So you can get like a feeling for how much money is being uh, generated month by month. And that, most importantly, translates into um, compute demand. Mm. Right? So each of these, each of me selling an instance basically says, okay, I promise this customer. 10 vCPUs, this customer, this much memory. Mm -hmm. So I, I basically get a, this. you could call this an order sheet for my yeah. warehouse, right? So this is how much I need to have in, in stock. And again, it looks very long because I just break it down per instance type, but ultimately mm -hmm. you don't see down here, this is how much memory I need. Um, yeah, here it's total memory needed, basically how much I sold. So, and, and this sheet is very important because this, simulates whatever assumption you want on how much customer demand has AWS, in this case, actually mm -hmm. created. And of course, my model here is very low key. Uh, you can make this 100 times bigger um, if, if needed. And it also supports GPUs and things like this. So now comes the interesting bit. Now you've- So before I start, just yeah. as if I can interrupt you. So we're running through this. Are you already recording, Max, for this part here? Because yeah. to what extent- Oh, you are? Okay, good. Okay, Thanks that case- Good stuff. All right. Um, the yeah. So so this is sheet one is 
demand modeling. This is really important. Um, and again, here you can you can literally go in there, copy the sheet, and just model the shit out of it, and make any assumptions you want on pricing as long as the structure stays the same. Um, and then just for the nerds who want to play with this model themselves, then if you copy the sheet, just make sure you add it here to this list of mm. um, available demand scenarios. And then you can make one of these green sheets here, or I don't actually see the color anymore, whatever the color is. Um, these, um, a sheet that looks like this. And then up here, you can basically select which demand scenario you want to have ah, on okay. top of it. So you do entirely decoupled the yes. things that people are selling from what the underlying infrastructure might be used to meet that particular demand because there's various gets, configurations. Gotcha. Yes, All right. It gets even gets even more sexy. Trust me. I, I, this is my. I'm very proud of this model. Um, so now you need to combine. You basically now need to build cloud infrastructure mm -hmm. to answer the demand, and for that you need a few ingredients. You need a data center. So in my case, I always assume that we're renting co-location space from somewhere because that's just very easy to model. Um, and I'm, I'm going to show you the database in a second. So I need a, I need customer demand. I need a co-location uh, and I need financing most of the time. I need mm -hmm. to, either, so, to somehow assume that there is an interest payment on my capital yeah. that I'm, I'm buying. And then there are some basic assumptions like how, how much of the hardware will fail per year. This I also mm -hmm. uh, factored in and... Um, this comes from the co-location config. So let me just quickly show you uh, the colo config. Yeah. So there's different co-locations here. Some of them are on actual market-based prices. For example, these three down here. These are numbers I actually got from a co-location. Mm -hmm. um, so we can we can use them. Two of them are in Norway. One of them is in Germany. Okay. Um, and these and are I, rent per, per per rack is on a monthly basis, correct? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I can't. Re I'm afraid of renaming anything. <laughs> um, yeah, it's on a it's on a monthly basis. Um, everything is is on a monthly basis. It makes it a bit easier to model mm -hmm. and to really see the progress. Um, financing is yeah really boring. It's just a percentage in case right. because I assume that you're gonna in an accounting perspective you're gonna not you're gonna pay for the rec on a monthly basis, not pay the one million upfront. Um, and the last component that we're going to need, so I'm going to show you, is, of course, you need hardware. Mm. So there is a whole database here of server prices, including like really expensive GPUs with, with Tesla, NVIDIA chips in there, mm -hmm. uh, but also like more off-the-shelf OCP gear mm. uh, and also uh, refurbished gear. So if you go all the way to the right here, you see that there's actual prices. These are real prices from real vendors um, that, that I use to model. Um, and you also see, so to say, how much power they consume, how much heat comes out of them. Yeah, it, everything is in here. And what this is they, power per rack per month is presuming you have an entire rack full yes. of that, uh, that, that loadout, right? Okay. Yeah, exactly. These are always fully stocked racks because you will see that thinking about it on a server level it's too small it never mm. you never get um you never get anywhere so if we go back to here so this only breaks because there's no gpus in here so just mm -hmm. ignore that part but now we have all those components mm. and now what this model does it, you see it when i change uh, to different demand scenarios yeah it it loads the summary of the other sheet here so mm. it loads how much revenue per month are we making that we configured before right Yep. How many vCPUs do we need? How much memory we need? And how much instant storage we need? What what you and I often talk about as primitives, right? Yeah. This is what the customer has bought and what I need to be able to provide. provide yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna and now this model actually supports that you buy racks. Mm. So I'm 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 really happy about that. So <laughs> ultimately down here you see utilization rate, something mm. we often talk about, right? So you see how well utilized is your and how oversubscribed is your infrastructure? Ah, you've modeled the okay, cool, yeah. All right? But I'm going to first uh, to just make this more fun. Um, so you can buy up to five different types of racks, not just one. Mm -hmm. You can mix it up. Um, but I'm going to not buy any racks. So just that you see, yeah, at zero. And let me just check if I can. 
you yeah. mentioned about the oversubscription thing. This is the idea of saying, well, I might have a bunch of computers which provide me with, which might logically expose a set number of CPUs. And in this case, you're saying, well, because I'm able to kind of sell them, sell more than I really have, just like how gyms work, I might sell, say, twice as many vCPUs. Uh, and as long as I'm maintaining some kind of SLA or people understand what the SLA is, I'm kind of golden, basically. Yeah. Yes. And you can in this model, so in a let's say in a in a traditional business sense, you would probably start a business by buying 10 racks, right? So you mm -hmm. would go like this. Um, so you you purchase 10 racks, and you see here that the purchase price in oh, sorry, I should explain. Um, we're gonna buy a memory. Now we're gonna buy a CPU heavy OCP rack, a simple one. Mm -hmm. um, you would see here. Look, I have to spend 2.5 million US dollars on this. They will last me five years. Um, mm -hmm. That would be the same business thing. And then you see also, though, you're completely, everything is green, which means you have way too many resources. Like your utilization rate is 5%. Okay. Right? So this because here, if you, oh. what you have listed here, you've shown that um, on, say, B213, for example, remaining vCPU, that's basically telling me I have this, I have five, th nearly around 5,500 vCPUs available for me to allocate to things. Yeah. And yeah, likewise exactly. for memory and storage. Gotcha. And, and storage, I actually, I ignore it because it's, it makes it, you would not do mm. that like this. That would do it differently. I focus really on CPU and memory and instant storage, which is, which is what you get from EC2. Mm. Um, but yeah, you, you see now I'm completely, basically I have a lot of idling infrastructure. So mm. let's say we run this a bit more aggressively then we would say, well, I buy only buy one rack. Mm. Right? And so month two down here, you see 333. Uh, you're already oversubscribed, right? So based on demand scenario that we picked, now you would already be like, your infrastructure would be bleeding, basically, <laughs> in, in principle. So a, as a good businessman, you would probably buy another rec quite quickly. So let's say in month four, mm -hmm. you're buying another rec. You're still oversubscribed at 180%, and then you let it rise to 300% oversubscription rate, and you buy another rec. And you buy oh, another get, rec. Yeah, yeah. Right? So... Like this is probably how it would look like. Uh, maybe we need to be a bit more. We need to buy a few more racks here. Okay, and this case here, the assumption is that every every month you're growing in the amount of demand that's coming in, so, which is why it started out green, and then the following month was another bunch of demand that you need to uh, yeah, exactly. deal with. Okay, got it. Uh, but then here, like the demand gets so big that I, uh, you need to basically, I'm going to buy a lot of racks here. Um, so I'm now averaging, uh, I could calculate the total average, but I would say I would buy another rack here. Otherwise it would be too tight there. Um, but you see, basically you can, you can run your own business here. You can mm -hmm. buy racks and, uh, fill them up. And if you want to mix the racks, you want to have a little bit more memory heavy. Like if I would have bought memory heavy racks that mm -hmm. are not so, that have a lot more, that's the reason why I had to buy so many racks now. I just want to show you. Oh, I'm too far on that. Sorry. Um, that's why I had to, because memory is the deciding factor. I can mm. tell you already. So if I buy these, very 768 gigs of memory per node, then you see my oversubscription rate on the CPU is now relatively high, mm -hmm. but on memory it's relatively stable. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. I'm just going to go back for the sake of it. Yeah. Um, do, 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 do. So now to the to the meat. So I did include this idea of an optimizer. So let's say you have idling servers. What you will do in a cloud environment is what everybody talks about now is you will do something like Lambda. Right? Mm -hmm. So you will fill up your underutilized equipment with functions and you will sell those functions at a, let's say, per function price. My model allows to simulate that, like how much value you can extract. But then for our recording today, I choose to ignore it because it makes it, again, a lot more complicated. Um, now the underlying performance of the business, right? So you have cost of goods sold. So you have to pay for the racks, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I said, we're leasing it so that you can, because that's most likely how people will do it. They will mm -hmm. raise capital and pay them racks basically on a month by month basis. You have co-location cost and you have power cost, by mm -hmm. the way, your favorite uh, 
this again based on Norwegian power price. Maybe we do on a German. Wow, price. yeah, <laughs> it's going to be messy. 2022 power prices in Germany. Yeah. yeah. So power price. And yeah, now the rack is still a lot cheaper, but the power is more expensive. So here you yeah. already had twenty thousand dollars a month, and this is all month here. Yeah. Just for power on four racks or so. Yeah. Mm. Um. Anyway, so you pay for the rec lease. So these are your costs. You pay for the co-location. This you pay for power. Uh, you pay maybe for the optimizer. But mm. That's for later. So this is your cost. And on those costs, you have in this month, in the very first month that we're simulating here, you have a hundred percent revenue. So um, you have you're making a loss essentially. Mm. But month two already, good news. You're clear in twelve. Especially yeah. because you're oversubscribing like crazy. You're uh, you're already hitting. Profitable well, again if you're leasing, right? So mm. there's no capital expenditure. You you hit profitability and your margin is relatively solid at 50%, by the way. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so if you want to go into business for everybody who's listened to this, I would open a cloud infrastructure business. Mm. It seems like a good idea. And you at here at the end I summed it for over a two-year period with this model, mm -hmm. you would have you would hit an average um, uh, profit margin of 53%. Um right away and again this doesn't include any salespeople or things like this but of course that you can see how much room there would be for sales and marketing if you have that much margin okay and this um, model is this idea that at the beginning of the month at the beginning when you're starting out with this it's going to take yeah. you a while to ramp up your sales efforts that's so okay gotcha that's why it's lower first gotcha yeah and it, like i said the demand scenario is now really like puma it's like pulled out of my ass like yeah it's a it's, a, it's an educated <laughs> guess you you could you could come up with an elaborate formula and say one salesperson can sell mm. 10,000 compute hours per month, right? Mm. Um, I don't have those data points, so I'm just guessing. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter how I scale this, the underlying profit margin will always kind of stay the same. The okay, market. gotcha. That's the point. And same as cash flow. Um, so, so that's essentially the model in a nutshell. Um, so you model demand your assumptions, like how much compute am I going to sell? You buy some racks, you rent some data center space, and you make some money. Mm. That's essentially this. What I also ignore is the development cost of the software to run cloud infrastructure, so OpenStack or Kubernetes or something like this. Mm. But again, my point is, if I have 50% profit margin, there's a lot, or 59%, if I spend half of that on engineering every month, um, so that would be you're still making like 25 percent net yeah yeah it's still compared to a commodity because this is a commodity business commodity businesses make five to ten percent margin mm -hmm. this is amazing All right and you can clearly see the more racks i buy mm -hmm. the more this is amazing okay and this basically gives you an idea why you probably this if you're making like 30% net, or if you like it, like we've seen on this, this gives you an idea why you're going to do everything you can to keep someone inside that market. And you'll have a chance to offer some sweetness to keep people on board because you've just got so much margin to keep a, give away to keep someone on board there. You've got a slush fund, essentially. Yes. Cool. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I don't know the official pricing, but I think the AWS reseller program, for example, or Microsoft's reseller program, they give up to like 20% of revenue to the, to the reseller, right? Mm. And this makes sense because even if you just make 5% profit on this, like for basically putting racks in a room and just adding more and more and more and more, that's still pretty good, pretty decent margin. Mm. But you also see that the data center, so the co-locator here is the biggest loser in that sense mm. because their costs do not are not proportional to the profit, by the way, which is what I try to tell a lot of data center people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they're not in the cool business they're in the, mm -hmm. in the in the in the infrastructure part so that, and i would also explain why they're feeling the squeeze and why a lot of the time they tend to say well we can't move the way the other groups are moving because we don't own the entire value chain because all the all the value is being accrued elsewhere in the chain for them basically and and realize something else so let's say here in month 12 right power costs are thirty nine thousand dollars a month compared to 49 14 thousand mm -hmm. for the rent so to say Mm -hmm. And now most co-locators, they add 5, 10, 15, 20, 30% on the power as margin. Mm -hmm. So do you really care about energy efficiency, by the way? Mm. 
I don't think so, because you're making a lot more money with selling power plus margin than you're making from selling room space plus cooling. Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, this is, this is, it helps for me, at least this model helps a lot explain how like cloud economics. Yeah. Work. The incentives are misaligned for you to have any kind of ceiling on the revenue you'd actually have. Like, um, in energy markets, what they, what people typically do or what some people do in some parts of the world, they'll have a revenue cap for regulated markets. So you have an incentive to basically say, well, I can only ever make this much revenue. I have to make my profit by being really efficient, but because you don't have anything like that. Yeah. There's no incentive to invest in efficiency at the DC level here. I mean, at the color yeah. at the co-location level. The only incentive you have here is to make the servers as full as possible, mm. right? So, so you you do have you don't want to underutilize any of the equipment that you bought. That that's your that's what you want. That's why this also this oversubscription is a good thing. Mm. Um, but I would say there is no, yeah, there, there's something wrong. You, I agree with you because this is too much and that mm. normally in economics says that there is something, some cost, some external externality mm. is not accounted for, but I struggle to point the finger at the right mm. exter ex externality that's missing. Gotcha. Um, yeah. yeah. And then also, by the way, if you sell cloud services, like a database bundled with compute hours, you can see why you would do that because mm. you, again, you you all you want to do li literally is increase this these numbers here the 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 amount of hours of computation you sold. Nothing yeah. else matters. And presumably, the higher you are, the closer you are to a customer. Like if you're selling a higher order service like a managed database or something, you're able you got a multiply there in the same way that you might have further down the line. So you can charge, and we've seen higher costs for say a managed database service compared to the underlying primitives beneath it. So you're pretty much incentivized to move as high, uh, uh, to, to build as many layers between your primitives as possible, because that's where a significant chunk of your, of your, of your profits are going to be uh, going to be for this. Yeah, it's classic bundling. Like if you get an electric car with electricity included, you can assume that the underlying margin is better for the, for the mm. person selling it to you. Um, I do want to point like one thing, maybe, an externality that I thought about a lot is because I asked then a lot of like digital ocean or, or scale way or scale mm -hmm. up or all these other companies, like why can't they do scale way? I think is pretty close. Why can't they match? Why can't they do this as well? And what I found is that um, buying the hardware is very difficult with traditional financing instruments because mm -hmm. The lifetime of a server, at least on paper, is five years, even though everybody everybody in the industry knows they last a lot longer. Mm. But the the um, the capital that you can borrow to buy all this hardware is very limited. And the the big difference to the hyperscalers is that they have um they have a cash generating core business. Mm. AWS has uh, Amazon with e-commerce, mm. Google has advertising, um Microsoft has their licensing business. So mm -hmm. you 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 have cash generating core business, lots of free cash flow, right? I think what's uh, Microsoft is uh, 53 oops, um, 53 billion. Mm -hmm. And so you are your own bank. So you don't need to go borrow money um, to I don't want ah, I see. So you don't need to like raise capital at like uh, you know you 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 end up with much much lower cost of capital cuz you're able yes. to yeah, I get you. You have you have so much cash. Yeah, here, yeah. uh, free cash flow, sixty-five billion. Yeah, sixty in, in thousand. So it's two thousand nineteen to sixty-five billion U.S. Yeah. dollars free cash flow. Well, that would make sense because you've seen like this year, Amazon if they cleared like forty-four over forty-four billion dollars in just this year. Uh, I think it's forty-four billion euros in twenty twenty-one uh, yeah. in uh, in this year and. You can see how you can spend invest sixty billion in capex and then just basically scale this out for years ahead at a really good and still make a kind of incredible margin on that by by comparison. All right. Yes. Yeah. So so I think so maybe the biggest market the, the more market failure is that financing organizations misjudge the um uh, sorry I didn't share this tab I meant to show this sixty five billion down here. 
it's it's wow. in thousands. Wow, good lord. Yeah. Yeah. The um so but back to the to the model, I think there is a there is a failure like financing organizations do not understand these models, nor do they understand why they should invest in hardware, because it seems like something that's gonna lose it's like buying a car. The moment you buy it, it loses its value. Yeah. With, with hardware it's true ish. Um but if this financing were available, I think there would be a lot more competition. Period. I see. Yeah. So if you could appreciate the server over a longer time period, yes. then you're okay. Got, gotcha. Like a wind park. I mean, it depreciates over 20 years. And so you see how much capital flows into wind parks because yeah. like amazing investment. But five years is too short for infrastructure funds. It's too mm. short. Um, and then you get like these horrible leasing contracts with like 15% interest. And with 15% interest, this loses a lot of its attractiveness. Mm. I can actually uh, do that for you. Crazy interest. <laughs> uh, oh, percentages. Uh, validated. No. Um, oops. We were in case two. So I go up here. Financing scenario. Crazy interest. Is this? Yeah. Uh, it doesn't lose. No, okay, it doesn't list too much. It's like about 10% less margin. Mm. Yeah, goes down by about 10%. On an end over the two years, yeah, by 10% approximately. But it's still it's still annoying. Um, if you can't, you, you as a business in this case, how much hardware are we buying at the end? How much would you have to borrow? Rec type one, purchase price. So let's just sum all these. That's. I'm looking at the bottom right corner there. It's about three million euros that you would have to mm. borrow in order to purchase this and to to borrow three million euros. I don't know if you've ever seen like a hosting company. Often it's like five employees, mm. small business. It's not possible, mm. um, especially not on hypothetical growth. And that's yeah. what what AWS did in the beginning. I believe, of course, there's no evidence for that, but they handed out all these free credits and bought all this hardware, knowing that eventually they will sell it, but taking a huge risk in the beginning um, and just buying demand, basically. Mm. Yeah. So this also explains why it would make sense to be able to spend like 100K per new customer, because if you're starting that and someone's once someone's inside, they're going to continue because uh, presumably, assuming everything goes well, once they've grown to a certain size, they, you know, they're already with you and they have that growth. And if they're expecting to grow, then you'll basically get the utilization later on. Yeah. Yeah. Theoretically, if we if if we if we wanted to spend, let's say, a week in a workshop together, we could turn this model into the first five years of AWS. We could basically use all their financial data. Um, and basically reverse engineer how their demand must have looked like. You can mm -hmm. also do it the other way around. You can film this part and then create a demand simulation from that. It's just that there, the amount of different EC2 price categories is just so mm -hmm. many that the model becomes so big. <laughs> it's already pretty big for one price class. Okay, well, this is useful. This, this at least gives you an idea of like hyperscale cloud economics and how they might be different to even like tier two kind of stuff or even be even before you go all the way down to like smaller data center providers, for example. Yeah. Yeah, this, this is the basics. Yeah. This, is how, this is how it works when you build any VPS. I mean, you could mm -hmm. do a virtual machine business on this. You could, um, you could run um, any kind of, yeah, What's Linode is a good example, mm -hmm. right? Digital Ocean. These things, that's these are their economics. This is how it mm. works. Okay, cool. This is actually useful. Where do you want to go next with this, Max? Because uh, uh, this is this has been super this has been super handy so far, and I'm glad we got it recorded. Yeah, me too. Um, I realized that we could uh, we could probably reverse engineer because I did realize that we know the racks and we know the footprint per rack. Mm. We could reverse engineer the environmental impact of a standard cloud business of a certain size 
um, just with this model without measuring anything. Because once you know which hardware they're using and how much power they're using and in which zones, we could make this model a lot bigger. Um, so, so maybe there's one thing that actually would be worth, or you could use for sanity check this. We have seen some published uh, studies about the number of data centers in the world. And we know that there are new hyperscale there's like something like 16 hyperscale data center like sites being deployed every i think it's either quarter or every year i i, I forget in the paper but i'll i'll share a link to a uh, li link for this you might be able to use that to sanity check some of the discussions about what the trajectory is likely to be because there's been a long time discussion about how value of how basically demand has been energy demand has largely been the same for the last like 10 years or so but we don't know what that's going to look like going for uh, going forwards. But we have a rough idea about where the sales are likely to be coming from. So if you were going to be looking at this, this would give you an indication of whether you would need to rely on growth higher up the services, higher up the stack, or whether you'd be expect like for example, you could probably model. Okay, what if you increased the amount of say compute that you sold compared to higher order services that you sold? Because that would give you an idea of how you would be able to kind of like meet the same demand, for example, whilst yeah. keeping the energy usage about the same, for example. Or you could sanity check that about what you what we've had previously. Because yeah, we do have some numbers there um, in 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 that document, for example. And we have also seen that the the the, the basically the uh, we, we we've 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 seen growth in sales from the very, from the, from the large hyperscalers, and we can also see how much energy they're looking to be using for this. And you could probably work out like a trajectory over the next five to ten years for this, uh, assuming you were going to keep the same economics as were outlined here. Yeah, I, that's a good idea, actually. Uh, maybe. So what you just made me realize is, of course, if we if we know how many data centers there are and we know mm -hmm. approximately how much power, like the rated power, like let's say they have mm -hmm. 16 data centers with 100 megawatts, each is 1.6 terawatts. Mm -hmm. um, then we know, um, um, then we know how many servers you need to put into that data center in order to fill it. Right? Mm -hmm. And then we could, we know how much revenue they're making. And then we could actually come up with a utilization rate. You could use that to figure some of this out. And also, you could use this to then project forwards and say, well, if you want to maintain energy usage or perhaps like reduce like the emissions over time, mm -hmm. they would mean that you would have to probably end up selling more, in the, you know, this, this much in the terms of high order services versus this much in terms of, say, the, the primitives, or you'd need to find another way to increase the over subscription ratio for the services that you might have because we do see some technologies and things coming out like that now there's things like cxl for being able to basically make better use of the memory you do have for example yeah, yeah so there's stuff like that that might be actually some way that you could then think about okay well how are you actually going to not just stop growing but reduce the emissions over time and that might give you an idea of what you could do about the embodied emissions over time as well because yeah until you have an entirely carbon free way of making chips that's going to be an increasingly large chunk of the emissions going forward from here especially through the well 2020s really yeah forecast and uh make simulations on efficiency gains basically on chips hardware and software yeah yeah so basically yeah it it, it uh, it's going to be a very big model the um what what you're proposing is to build we could build a cloud in a spreadsheet at at a certain with a certain level of scale um we just make it less the only thing we cannot make so wide is the amount of variance between the different compute types because mm. that just again makes this model just insanely long and i don't think it makes such a big difference you could you could build a cloud with just one type of hardware and sell only one type of mm. instance type um yeah it's possible yeah I, the moment you asked me about this model i also started thinking about it again that you could actually build 
the an, an entire cloud business end to end and then like you said run it into the future with a five year outlook and see what kind of improvements and or what kind of impact and scale will you have in five years from now if you keep growing like this yeah i mean because the reason i think this is actually useful is because we have seen you can see like the mark you can see the growth in sales every single time and we've seen the whole discussion around growth in usage has been decoupled from this now the takeaway i get from this is that there isn't the same like the way you you achieve that the way we've achieved that decoupling so far is to basically move everything to cloud and if you're going to be doing that then there's going to be we we know that the the kind of the 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 degree that efficient that gains in efficiency have offset gains in growth have uh, we know that that's not going to keep going uh, based purely on moore's law so it'll have to come from other places and uh, the thing we'd probably end up with here is say well okay we need to know roughly if if cloud is growing at 20% year on year, then you would need to increase efficiency 20% year on year to kind of maintain that. Or you might need to increase hardware efficiency by whatever that figure would be year on year to maintain uh, at least the same amount, even if we uh, even before you think about getting it to zero, for example. And this is yeah, go on. But in principle, isn't the same? Isn't that the same as basically saying? Starting today, we can't build any more data centers. So, say, so to say, we whatever growth comes, we must serve with the infrastructure we have. I mean, that that would be the the best way from a sustainability perspective, right? To just use what we have and and uh, upgrade the chips, not upgrade the servers. Just maybe we just replace the CPU on the motherboard. You know, mm -hmm. like I kind of don't know at this point because we've um. We've seen here that a lot of the gains have come from being able to pool resources such that you're able to access the same kind of equivalent of resources for this. And uh, I'm not sure that I'm not sure if switching the the CPU is a thing in uh, versus making a change in terms of a system on a chip, for example, because we've seen how things like different kinds of hardware have been able to achieve different degrees of efficiency like ASICs or GPUs or even the whole CXL thing that we see right now or systems systems on a chip uh, that we see with like say Apple M1 versus the pre what you had previously so yeah. I I kind of feel that yeah that may be one that may be one of the conclusions you take away from it but it may be the case if we just look at these numbers here the thing you might say well we have to make these numbers go down uh to, to get to zero and this is one of the approaches but if there isn't if we're not going to do that then we'll need to have if you're going to like swap out for example servers with entirely new servers then they're going to need to be that much more efficient to account for the extra embodied energy that has that would come from switching the entire server versus switching the ships the, the the chip for example and i'm not sure it's sane to try modeling it in this spreadsheet but that at least gives you at least give you a different framing to have a conversation about and think think about what you might incentivize at a kind of like policy level i suppose for this yeah i think that that's a good idea it, that's why I, I i buy into your in your thought process i do want to maybe to conclude this do want to say on your but still on your point the pricing of aws on memory is also what from my experience in the hosting uh, business is the constraining factor because memory is often occupied mm. whereas cpu is like really you know take it the goodest oldest example is a database server a database server boots and you configure mysql and you say just take 36 gigs of memory and, and and block that right? yeah and that the reason why they probably price on memory is because that's the one resource that you can't oversubscribe mm. so that's your constraining factor and we've seen in the ocp development that you all they're working on 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 a, on a chip level is to increase the ratio of memory to CPU. So mm. now you, I think the, the you can get like you can fit like 1.5 terabytes of memory on two CPUs, because the CPUs are often like I mean look at a WordPress site or like a classical application. Mm. The the CPU is often at like 10 percent, yeah, and then okay the user comes and then it spikes to 80 percent for mm. two, two seconds. But memory is the one thing that's like, I mean, it's living I, in there because, yeah. yeah, I'm thinking about like a Grafana cluster. You, you, you always in these, in these metrics, you see like memory is like a big, big, big block. Um, yeah. 
if I have the login here. Uh, so to be clear at my end, and for anyone who's watching this, while AWS is being used here, I don't think it's, uh, I, I, I think I can speak for Max when I say this, AWS is mainly used as a reference one because it's the largest operator in the cloud market with more than half of the market. That's the only reason I'm doing it. I'm not particularly that bothered about uh, Amazon or bring or or, or 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 punishing some huge company. It's just that it's it's the, it's it's the it's the most significant operator in here, and it's the one that most people think of when they think of cloud. All right, Max, what are we looking at here, for example? Because this six. Um, <laughs> I don't know what I'm looking at other than like a big Grafana thing of load across uh, across a bunch yeah, of hosts, presumably. So, so, so this is a is a rack full of hyperscale hardware. Mm -hmm. So this is literally basically a rack how you would find it mm -hmm. in the AWS data center. And I agree with you. It, with AWS we always use because it is the biggest host. It, this is equally applicable to Azure, Microsoft, but also OVH cloud, least web. Mm -hmm. Digital Ocean, Scaleway, whatever, it's all the same um, uh, uh, principles. And you see here is the, these are non-utilized, but down here are some. This is what I meant. Like memory use is, the memory is basically fully occupied, but mm -hmm. CPU is basically non-existent on this host. Uh, can I just say only this host? No. Um, but this is, I think, the most common scenario that we have in IT is, is down also these hosts here. Like, memory is fully occupied, but CPU is, is idling. Like, down here you see it. It's it, green ah. means it's idling. Um, and, and I know these servers literally right now, they're running and do nothing. Mm. But do not be afraid. They're running on real physical renewable energy <laughs> and the heat is being recovered. So this is guilt. I call it guilt-free computing. Plus, the servers are refurbished. Mm. So, um, before you ask, I do have the domain guildfreecloud.com, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and and this here, you again, this is a good example. This is what I was looking for. So this was actually ah. So something happened. This is like here you go see the CPU load going up mm. a little bit, and then somewhere I have the correlated. I just I, I need to break it down to one server. This is too much. Um, this. Whoa. I need to take blocky things uh, thing. So CPU, yeah, unfortunately, there's no load. <laughs> uh, let's do, uh, didn't record. Um, bad example. Yeah, I don't have any active, I don't run any applications anymore. That's my problem. But here you still see the point. This is already like, what is it doing that it has 21% of its memory of which is like significant memory. Mm. Um, occupied and the CPU is free. Okay, so this also actually gives you this also can help explain why it makes a why the idea of something like serverless, which essentially compresses this over time, is yep. so useful because you're able to like free up resources so they're able to be reused in multiple cases in a way that you wouldn't be able to do before. And this kind of also impl implies that um, if you've got things like um, being able to read things from SSD in an efficient fashion, then that's going to be economically very, very interesting because it means that you free up the RAM that you would otherwise need to be reliant on, for example. Huh. I hadn't actually, actually yeah. On the on the disks, that's something that I, I, I often explain to people. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just Googling something real quick. The, so so the, the biggest innovation in an OCP rack is, is this, right? There's, um, sorry, can I zoom in? Mm. Yes, I can. Um, so, because what you just said was was disk, and here you see there's four networking cables in mm. the server, and that's a lot, right? That's not normal. And the idea is that in a, in a hyperscale, in a, in a cloud environment, the disk can be somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So you can have a disk in one server one and you use compute in server three. And that makes these functions, what, what you just mentioned, incredibly amazing because you, you, you can have the code of the function sitting anywhere on any disk and then boot that code in any computer that has idling CPU. Mm. And, and this is also how EC2 works under the hood. As long as you don't have attached storage, like the, the, the fast storage, you use EBS, then you basically, you can, they can move you and you won't even notice. 
and it's um, that's an incredible engineering feast. And it's driven by the fact that you have four Ethernet ports with 25 gigs each or 100 gigs each or 40 gigs each. Is they over-engineered the network so they mm. can just move everything around. Okay, that's just like, um, I guess it feels it goes back to energy again, right? You know how like transmission is the limiting factor on the actual yes. energy grids that we are relying on? Yeah, essentially what you, you have here. Huh. Yeah. So, so, but this, I, I think like from a mentally engineering perspective, we all learned that doing things on NFS or mm -hmm. like some kind of network-based file storage is a bad idea. And they basically figured out how to do that by just over making the network so big that, that you don't feel it anymore. Huh, cool, Max. All right. So we've gone through. Let's uh, summarize where we are for anyone who might be following along for this. So we've run through uh, this model explaining pretty much how you start with a set of demand that you might be looking to be selling. We then match that to different configurations of essentially the hard that you might actually use. And we've also spoken a little bit about the kind of oversubscription factor, which currently isn't something that we tend to, that I've seen modeled particularly in that much detail with any of the open source tracking tools like Cloud Carbon Footprint or anything like that so far. And that's probably one thing that comes from this. So we've got, we've got the demand, we've got the way that you can show that, and then we've also demonstrated how this can be used to kind of model different scenarios going forwards if you wanted to have a like data informed discussion about reducing the environmental impact of cloud with taking into account the emissions from the actual service and creating this. Okay, cool. Uh, Max, I think this is actually really good. It might be worth just talking about what things are explicitly not in that we might want to refer to just so that to head off someone saying, you didn't think about the buildings or stuff like that, because there's probably a list of things that it would be useful to be talking about that would also have implications on this that at least we can point people to. And then later on, we can either point to some, ex some resources or similar things if anyone is following along with this kind of research themselves. Yeah, so I, I think all the physical infrastructure is ignored because it's it's embedded into that cost for the co-location. So you you pay the co-location provider, they have a building, they have the cooling system, it's all included in that. Um, I do factor in also the efficiency of the building so that depending on the building you, you model here, it uses different efficiency ratings. So that is all included. What we don't include is any form of people and software. So the people you need to run this, not included. The people you need to so you need to build the software to do it, not included. Licensing costs for any cloud infrastructure software or VMware licenses or whatever, mm -hmm. not included. Um, but again, you can do that yourself. You just have to come up with some sane assumption. Mm. If you think you need to spend $50 million in capital to build a cloud software, then you can assume that and use that as an input. Um, but again, these people cost, they get, they're very opinionated. And so mm -hmm. I... This is really about what we do we have facts on and what can we observe? And then there's a lot of profit and that profit you can spend on people. Okay. And the thing that uh, where, which is probably have has implications for us when we talk about, you know, higher up the stack and lower down the stack here, we talk a little bit about the cost of energy, but we're, we're not trying to do anything like model the infrastructure costs that you might need for the fact that each rack has something like a megawatt or so of 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 draw in each of these. Because when I think when I looked at your when you when you showed me the like a rack of GPUs, well, that was in the region of thousands of kilowatts of draw, which is that's megawatts of power. That's um that's significant amount of of of, of draw there. I think. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, you get up to forty kilowatts. But yeah. what you um when you when you put ten racks together, yeah, that you get significant um. Yeah, significant um, power draw. Yeah, for sure. So this here, just just to be clear, this this set here in the the numbers here, the, the, these are the these, this is basically a CPU, and we're looking at the power draw from the from one CPU or a rack of no, CPUs for the, in this for, case. For the ra whole rack. So unlike when we look at normally, you know, this Intel Rappel shit, we we look at only the CPU, but these are actually the rated power of the of the real servers multiplied by how many servers do I fit in a rack? Um, so these are actual numbers that are trustworthy that come from the manufacturers. Um, so it's the whole it's the whole rack 
In this case here, ah, I see. You gotcha. it's 40 kilowatts, and there you have uh, 900. Six, wait, how many CPUs? Uh, there's 70, 12 GPUs in there. Mm -hmm. um, and you see how many chassis you can fit per rack. Oh, I see. Yeah. And then it, it, yeah, you get to some like, so physical core is 480. But what type of CPU is in here? Sorry. Too many. Yeah, here, done. Ah, yeah. Physical cores per CPU is 12, 20 uh, CPUs per chassis. Yeah. Yeah. So you get something like two CPUs, uh, but how many chassis? <laughs> 12. Yeah. Uh, so you have 24 CPUs mm. in total in this rack. Yeah. But 12 GPUs on top. It's actually quite small. Like a really big one would be this. There you have seven, 72 V100 Tesla chips. Mm. Um, that's bigger. Um, and then the power looking, goes up. All right. So in this case, you're looking at maybe once you've got something like 50, let's assume there's an average thing of between 20. If there's if it's like a median figure of, say, 20 kilowatts of draw maximum. Yeah. And as soon as you're at, like, say, 40 to 50 racks, you're looking at a megawatt of draw automatically. And that's going to have – and uh, whenever you have a significant chunk of that, there's going to be – changes you might need to have in the transmission or stuff beneath it to actually account for a data center kind of drawing that deeply into the grid to pull uh, pull, pull, pull stuff out like that as well at that rate. And that's that's a, maybe an externality that, that we didn't talk about is that, yes, so so you need more power infrastructure and who pays for that, right? That's society that, that's offloaded into into the into the grid operators they have to build like uh, high voltage power lines they have to build a new substation whatever but that's paid for by what we as society put into uh, grid fees basically so yes the energy infrastructure is not included in this at all okay all right cool well max thank you for taking the time to run me through this uh i don't think i've ever been through such a nerdy spreadsheet but hopefully this being in the public domain will be useful to inform discussions and not least with our our coming interview or discussion on the green software podcast in yeah. uh in, in in the coming days all right yeah, cheers, now max. you know what it's all based on cheers yeah thank you chris cheers mate